Thank you very much for coming. This seminar is about um, how to avoid hard openings. And I'm not talking about those little openings that are annoyingly quick. I'm talking about primarily the ones that seriously injure people and in some cases kill people. Those one in a million openings, um, mainly. That's the main goal. The second goal is just to make your openings nicer and sweeter. My name is John LeBlanc. I'm from Performance Designs. And let's get started. First, who I am. I made my first jump in 77 in the Republic of Panama. I was 16 years old. Um, my dad was in the military and he got stationed in, in an Air Force base in Tampa. And I heard there's this place called Zephyr Hills, the mecca of skydiving. So I said, let's go to Tampa. Jumped there for my last year of high school. And then I heard about an aeronautical university in DeLand, Florida, excuse me, in Daytona Beach. And when I heard there was a place called DeLand, just outside of Daytona, and I knew there was a drop zone there, I was sold. So I got a degree in aeronautical science, a bachelor's degree, uh, in 1983. And uh, I never went and got that flying job. I was too addicted to skydiving. And a friend of mine had started uh, performance designs right at the tail end of college. And he asked me to join him, so I doubled the workforce. We are now a workforce of two people. And uh, it kind of took off. I'm, I'm the company vice president. I still do all the design work on the canopies just because it's my passion. I work with other people, but I'm kind of mentoring them. We have about 300 employees now, and it's been a really wild ride. I've really enjoyed it. So my intentions for this seminar are to discuss the factors that affect your opening speed and uh, explain how to control these factors so that you can best avoid those once in a while really hard openings. I, I'm trying to make this suitable for all experience levels from student all the way up to, you know, you know everything. <laughs> and uh, it's not a packing seminar. You don't see any parachutes up here. I'm not giving you little tips on things to do with your, your bits and pieces and how to fold your stabilizers. There's a lot of things people talk about on how to pack a parachute to get a, a good opening. And they're just things that sound good to somebody and it doesn't seem to hurt. So they, they do it. But some of those things really aren't as important as some people would have you to believe. On the other hand, we have found that there are a few things that you have to keep, keep track of and keep control of, and I'll mention just those things. I want to avoid complex aerodynamics or formulas. It doesn't matter if you can recite the lift and drag equations and what the Q is in the uh, opening characteristics formula. It's all impressing people who are impressed with you know, academia, but it doesn't help you when you just got whacked on an opening and you don't know why, okay? So let's get going. First thing is some of the things that affect the way your parachute opens when it opens the way it's supposed to have to do with the type of parachute. Uh, so I'm going to get really basic, move back from the current equipment and, and go to just parachutes in general here. Um, let's go as far as the type of parachute that's the old troop type round parachute and maybe a gliding parachute like we use. Um, there are certain design elements that dictate basically how this thing's going to open. I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, for the ram air canopies, which we all jump, things like the line type and the fabric, the type of reefing, meaning does it have a slider? Does the slider have fabric in it or mesh? Um, are there other reefing devices? Uh, there are some parachutes that actually have the slider attached to the pilot chute by a line to help keep it up. These sorts of things affect the basic way the parachute opens. Also, the method of deployment. Is it deployed with, a, with what we call a free bag? Does it have a line stow pouch? Or does it have regular suspension line stows? Um, is it a spring-loaded pilot chute? All these things are factors, OK? They don't dictate by, all by themselves how a parachute opens, but they're some of the things that influence it. So there's this thing that, this concept of, of the deployment sequence, we've all heard about it. You, you learn about it as a student learning how the parachute opens. It's designed into a parachute system. Let's take, for example, the old round reserve that was on the chest mount. Has anybody ever jumped that old equipment out there? Has anybody deployed that reserve on their chest? 
Uh -huh. Only I see less and less hands, but I'm glad you're still out there. Um, <laughs> what's really interesting, um, you guys have all heard this, this uh, term called an out-of-sequence opening, right? You've heard that? Well, the, the chest mount military round reserve is designed, the deployment sequence, the, way, the order in which things happen, is what we would now call an out-of-sequence opening. Okay, when you pull the ripcord, the container just goes, psh, opens, and then stuff goes everywhere. But what's interesting is the first thing you see is parachute fabric going everywhere. It's just going all over the place. And then you see lines on stowing. They're actually stowed in the container here. And you see the lines going, and everything's going away. That parachute's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which would normally slow you down, right? but it doesn't because the lines aren't tight yet. <laughs> so that means when the lines finally get all the way out and, and they get tight, the parachute's already quite big and it whacks the heck out of you, <laughs> okay? It's a very hard opening, but what's interesting about it, due to other factors in the design of the parachute, it actually works pretty good like that. It's completely out of sequence by today's standards, but the fabric is not zero P. It's not even that low porosity F-111 style fabric. It's a bit like cheesecloth. A lot of air goes through it. <laughs> so that slows how fast the thing inflates. Also, the lines aren't this low bulk Vectran or HMA or Spectra. That stuff actually has less elasticity in it than, uh, than steel piano wire. No, the lines aren't even Dacron, which is much more elastic. It's used on a lot of tandem canopies and student canopies. It's actually more elastic than that, it's nylon. It's like the parachute fabric. It actually stretches 30% in length before it fails. So that parachute gets to the end of the lines and it goes brrrring like a big rubber band when it hits the end of the lines and that's why you don't get hurt. Now you may remember your feet hitting your head behind you on opening and all that stuff and good thing we were younger back then. But the point is is that that parachute opens by today's standards completely out, of, completely out of sequence, but it's designed to be tolerant of that. It's not to say you couldn't improve the openings if you put things in a better sequence, but it's completely, by today's standards, out of sequence. Now you try to do that with a modern parachute and it will kill you on opening. You must keep it in sequence. Okay, does that make sense? So the type of deployment sequence will help influence the openings. Now there's also factors that are controlled or controllable, shall we say, either by yourself as the jumper or by your packer or both. One of them is how fast you're going at airspeed or how fast you're going at, at, at opening time. Your packer can't help that, okay? Another is the method of packing and the quality of the pack job. Now there are some people who feel the only good pack job is a finished pack job. <laughs> Whatever finished is to that person. But, but the quality of the pack job does make a difference. It may not make a difference on every single opening, but it can be one of the things that gets kind of weird once in a while, especially when packers get busy, shall we say. <clears throat> also, to be more specific, the position of the slider within the pack job is, is an important thing. We've, most of us have heard that. The line stows how they're stowed, and where they're stowed makes a difference. And the pilot chute, the size of the pilot chute and its condition, and also the, the, what it's made out of. <clears throat> There's some other factors too, and I'll get into those later. Let's talk about the first one, airspeed. Okay? Bottom line, slow down <laughs> before, you, before you open your parachute. Okay? Now, of course, to do that, you have to be aware of how high you are, right? If you're standing on your head and suddenly you go, oh, and you're low, okay, you may not have the altitude to slow down <laughs> and pull and still have enough altitude for a safe opening. So you've got to plan better next time, but pull now, okay? But you should be able to plan your jump so that you can slow down well before you pull. Now let's think about that a little bit. Most of us, when we were trained, how many were trained in static line in this, in this room? And how many were trained in, in uh, AFF or, or some sort of accelerated method? Okay, about 50-50. 
think about, imagine you're an instructor and you're gonna let this guy go out the door and watch as the parachute opens. You're most concerned with that jumper being very stable on pull time, right? So they're gonna teach you a body position that emphasizes good stability. So they're gonna talk about a very aggressive arch. Some people use the word hard arch. Some people don't like that, but that's for the instructors to, to debate. But the point is, is that it's very, very arched and it promotes stability, right? Makes sense for a student. You don't want the guy tumbling through the parachute when it opens. That's not very good for the reliability of the opening. Okay, but as your experience grows, you learn how to be stable in a more natural way. And you also start maybe jumping different equipment that may be a little less tolerant of not only body position on opening, but also airspeed on opening. The student equipment is fairly forgiving of that type of thing. It's designed to be for the safety of the, of the student. But at some point when they start downsizing to different uh, parachutes with different line types and deployment systems, and they're starting to experiment with different types of skydiving, it's time to change the emphasis from pure stability at opening to slowing down, a more effective method of, of, of slow fall. So instead of a big arch at pull time, and then a, a pull, and then a check, or however they teach it, uh, maybe it's better to, to flatten your arch, or even reverse arch, before pull, okay? Because it'll slow you down more, and the more you slow down your body, the less the parachute has to do to slow you down, okay? Now obviously you wouldn't teach a student to deploy the parachute like this, because he's gonna fall over on his back, right? So what I'm saying is there's a transition in that regard. Make sense? So this, this emphasis shifts to a, a, a more effective slow falling position over a period of time as the jumper becomes more comfortable with the idea that he can stay stable while he pulls. Okay, I think that's sometimes ignored in the transition to newer gear. <clears throat> Going too fast is actually one of the biggest causes of, of uh, hard openings, including an occasional hard opening. Okay, and the reason is because the faster you go, the more likely that that orderly deployment sequence is gonna have some little something go wrong with it, okay? By slowing down, you, keep, you help keep all those other factors in control that we'll discuss next, <clears throat> okay? So they may, as I said, be in, inconsistently hard, which is a tough one to, to track down because you think you're doing everything the same, but just a little bit extra airspeed in combination with some of these other things I'm gonna talk about will be the one little extra thing that causes a heart opening, along with all the other things that are just under the surface. <clears throat> so moving on, the slider position. Obviously, you want all four grommets against the slider stops, okay? Everybody's heard that, but there's a couple things sometimes people make uh, mistakes on. Number one, uh, in some places they teach the students how to pack in a method called a flat pack, where you lay it on the ground, pull the packing tabs. So you guys still do that with your students here most of the time, yes or no? Yeah. Some do, some don't, okay. Well, at, at a certain point, the, the uh, jump master will say, grab the slider, and they grab it by the center between the four grommets, and they, they kind of go like this. They go, okay, bring the slider down the lines, and when it gets to the top, they're still holding the center of the slider and they pull it until it doesn't move any farther. So that means at least some of those grommets are against some of those slider stops, but you don't know whether all four of them are against the slider stops until you check all four. And some of the older parachutes, the PD, Nine Cells, the Mantas, the slider doesn't sit evenly against the grommets. Two of them are against the stops. Two of those slider stops are farther inside the pack job, and that alone has caused a lot of hard openings, unfortunately, for students. So you want to make sure all four grommets are against all the slider stops, okay? Um, for a, a pro pack, obviously, where you've got the lines over your shoulder or hanging from a hook, the, the slider is down inside the, uh, the pack job, right? And you can see all four grommets are against the stops. Well, you want to keep them there throughout the whole pack job, all the way until all the lines are stowed. There's a concept called quartering the slider where you take the, the, perimeter, the perimeter tape that goes from grommet to grommet around the, the, the slider. And people say to take the, the, the sliders, uh, excuse me, the tapes that are on the left and right sides of the slider, and you pull them out 
in the same way you would clear your stabilizers. And they also say to take the tape in the front and the rear of the slider and pull them to the front and the back of the parachute. We've all heard that, right? Some people kind of overemphasize that. What they do is they take the slider and they pull the back this way and they pull the front this way and they pull the side this way and they pull the side this way. And what's happening is all that slider fabric is getting pulled straight and taut up where the grommets are. You actually want to take that slider fabric and push it down inside the pack job. Okay, does that make sense? You want the grommets um, in the right position. You want the tapes around like this, but you want the fabric down inside. And let me tell you why. As you continue with the pack job and you put it on the ground and you get all the air out of it and everything, having the slider up inside the, the pack job where the fabric is pulling up helps keep the grommets up against the bottom of the slider stops. Okay? If, you're, if you start like getting a little too aggressive getting the air out of it or doing something, the slider grommet may want to try to move down the lines, but it can't because that fabric up underneath the middle of the pack job is, is preventing it from moving, especially if you've got some body part on top of it. It can't really move away from the slider stops as easy. And when the parachute's coming out of the bag, the fabric up inside the pack job is helping to keep those slider grommets up against the slider stops as the parachute's coming out of the bag. But if you overemphasize this pulling of the tapes to where the fabric is all fluffed up, it's all like sitting there in a big ball of fabric and grommets just ready to fall down the lines prematurely. Does that make sense? So you don't want to overdo the quartering thing. You want to push the fabric down inside the pack job. Okay. Next step is bagging the canopy. Pretty simple. Make sure that the organization that you've done in your flaking and packing of the parachute is maintained throughout the whole bagging procedure. Some people have the most beautiful pack job and they do a bunch of stuff that I don't bother with. They, some people get really pretty with their, with their stabilizers. They fold this one over and then this one and then they take this one and they take this one and then they take this one but they think it's all messed up so they get rid of it and they do it again and then when they're all satisfied they take the whole parachute and go plop on the ground and it goes everywhere. Okay, so you want to maintain that organization. You want to keep the tension through the risers and through the lines and all the way through to the top of the parachute throughout the whole bagging process. Okay? There are many methods to do that. The method I use works great for me. It might work terrible for you. And your method might work great for you, but it feels awkward for me. So whatever the method is, this is the goal. <clears throat> the bag should be sized properly for the parachute and the rig. Okay? This is a one that we caught us by surprise on the early days of the, of the uh, Sabre when it first came out. The Sabre was our first zero-P parachute, and it was the second zero-P parachute on the market in modern times. There actually was a, another zero-P seven-cell parachute with valves or airlocks in it that was put out in the late 60s. Nobody remembers that one. <laughs> it was a scary parachute. It's called the Parasled for anybody who's interested. But it was difficult to keep these slippery parachutes under control when we put them in the bag. So we had this idea that we thought would work really good. Make the bag bigger. It'd be easier to stuff the parachute into that bag. And for a long time we recommended that. And after a little while we started noticing that the openings were inconsistent with a lot of our customers. And uh, it turns out that when the parachute bag is sized properly, the parachute is contained by the bag well. And when those last little locking stows come open and the mouth of the bag comes open, the parachute is held inside the bag by the tension created by how tightly it's in the bag. And then that little first fold, that slider fold, gets pulled out of the pack job when it's opening. But the rest of the parachute is still being held by the bag, so it kind of unfolds the parachute in a nice way. But when the bag was sized too large, it was this big blob of chaotically organized fabric because it was an easy bag to stuff everything in there, so that's what people did. So it all came out kind of like bleh, just like all over the place. And it didn't make bad openings every time, but they became more inconsistent, especially when some of these other factors were added. So you want to size the bag properly. If it's too loose, the canopy just flops out in a big mess. But at this, so that's why you should fill the canopy snugly and include the corners. You don't just want a big blob in the middle and nothing in the corners. Your rig looks ugly like that too. But also, you want to have the bag such that the canopy can be in the bag completely 
where the mouth of the bag actually covers the parachute completely. The grommets on the bag come up right to where the rubber bands are, as opposed to stretching a rubber band across a bunch of fabric down to a grommet that's uh, you know, four or five centimeters away. That does not contain the, the canopy as well as it should be contained. Parachutes are more reliable on deployments when they're inside a bag. And the more parachute fabric that's exposed, the less reliable the parachute is on opening. <clears throat> okay. If you do see this rubber band stretched across the fabric, it's either that your bag might be a little too tight, or maybe you just need to be a little neater with the flaking and packing of the parachute. I'm not going to do it with this. Well, I can actually. Imagine you take a piece of paper and you just crumple it up and it looks like this, right? It's a certain size and I can squish on this pretty hard, but it's, it's pretty big because there's lots of random chaotic folds on this and I can't really get it much smaller. But if I took this and folded it in half and creased it, folded it in half again and again and again, I might get to a point where I can't fold it anymore, right? But it's going to be a lot smaller than this. Okay, so if it's a more neat pack job with more neat and organized folds, it goes into the bag better. It's easier. Okay? Line stows. Basic rule, each stow should, be, uh, should hold the lines with adequate tension to keep it on there until it's forcefully removed by the process of the opening. Now, how tight is tight enough? Well, we, we tried to create a guide because there were a lot of strange things we were hearing. Um, what we decided to do was to take a spring scale, like a fishing scale, spring with a hook, and we would attach the hook to the pilot chute end of the bridle and have the parachute and its container laid out flat on the ground with the bag on the ground, okay? And then we'd, with the, with, when it got to the end of the line stow, we would just very slowly and gently apply pressure to the spring scale and just note the force. And as the force builds up, when that stow comes off, it should be somewhere between eight and 12 pounds of force for each and every stow, about three and a half to five and a half kilograms. Okay, now I'm not saying you jerk on it and see what happens because the force goes way, way high. That's, a, that's not the reading we're looking at. It's eight to 12 pounds when you slowly apply, apply more and more and more force. And if your stow method does this, then you're in the area where we believe the parachute uh, should have its line stowed. Okay, so we provide these little small rubber bands with our parachutes when they leave the factory if they have low bulk lines. Some people ask us, is that what I should use? They're a pain in the neck. And I say, well, if they provide the proper stow force by this definition, then they're good. Okay, I will say though that there are a lot of suppliers of these small rubber bands but they're a little bit different than ours. In some cases, the actual thickness and the width of the rubber band is a little bit smaller, and they're a little bit stretchier. In some cases, they're also a little bit larger, and they do not provide that eight to 12 pound force, okay? So our rubber bands do, our small ones, when they're new, of course, they start to stretch out and maybe start getting cut and weak on the edges. It's time to replace it. You don't wait until it breaks to replace it. What about the large rubber bands? Well, a large rubber band on small lines is clearly not enough force. The lines fall out of those stows very easily, but you can double stow. You, everybody knows what that is, right? You, you wrap it around once and then a second time. When you do that, it easily gets this eight to 12 pound range on most large rubber bands, okay? But the best thing is to measure that force with a spring scale in the manner that I mentioned and see for sure what it is. <clears throat> the length of the stow, okay? The, the length is a factor because when the, when the pilot chute lifts the parachute out of the, out of the container, it does so very forcefully. And the parachute and the line stows want to stay in the container. The only thing that's keeping that parachute in the bag is those line stows. But there's a section between the left and right sides of each line stow between the rubber bands and it has weight and it wants to sag down because it's being pulled out so quickly. And that weight of that line between the left and right line stows can be enough that it actually, the, that weight actually tries to unstow the lines for you, okay? That's why you need to have them tight, but that's also why you need to have them of sufficient length so you've got a little bit of line stow on the other side 
that's hanging off the other side of the rubber band trying to keep the stow in there. So for single stows, between two and a half to three inches is about where you want it. That's seven, uh, six to seven and a half centimeters. Um, for a long time, riggers would say, never stow more than an inch. But there's a reason for that when they were saying that. They were lightweight round reserves with a very unusual diaper style uh, deployment system where the stows were very close together and an inch was enough to ensure that everything stayed closed and people were stowing crazy long stows and using wrong, wrong rubber bands and they were having slow reserve deployments in the days when most reserves were opened at about a thousand feet. <coughs> so they kept saying no more than an inch, <coughs> but it's not enough with modern lines with these small rubber bands. On double stows, you actually want to stow a little bit less. <clears throat> and the reason is because of the nature of the way the double stow has to come off of the, uh, the, rubber, uh, the line stow. You actually are pulling on that line stow and the rubber band is stretching. And as soon as the rubber band stretches enough to have the end of the stow come through, then it'll come out the first twist and then out the second one. So about an inch and a half to two inches works well with that. <clears throat> You'll find you have less broken rubber bands, which really isn't a problem other than at being annoyance. But they tend to come off cleanly, more cleanly, and you get better deployments from that with the double stows. So the big question is, well, what's better, single or double? Well, again, I go back to that, that uh, force that you test with the spring scale, but at PD, all of the jumpers at PD, uh, almost everybody, prefers to double stow a large rubber band on all of our low bulk suspension lines, okay? In other words, Microline, Vectran, HMA, Orange Vectran, okay? Uh, what about paid packers? Um, you're gonna get what they give you unless you specifically ask, okay? So people wonder why we still put those small rubber bands in, our, in with our parachutes when we send the parachutes out, it's hard to mess up a small rubber band, okay? You put those small rubber bands on and they pretty much work pretty close to what we're talking about here. But you put a large rubber band on there and you give it to a packer, is he gonna double stow? Is he gonna double stow everything? If he breaks one, is he gonna put something else on there, a tube stow or a small rubber band? Mismatching them tends to do weird things. So you need to take responsibility for it if you're going to put the large rubber bands on it to make sure that they're all double stowed. Ask your packer, I want you to double stow all of these bands. And if something breaks, replace it with another one just like it. I've actually heard packers in some of the larger centers in the US say, I don't have time to double stow. You get single stows from me because I'm too busy. I'm a professional packer. For me, I choose a different packer. You can do what you want. <clears throat> so if you don't really know who's packing or there's a bunch of scary looking people and, and they just seem to have come off the street and they're fluffing and stuffing and it looks scary, maybe those small rubber bands might be best because they're harder to screw up for those drop zones. Maybe it's better for you to pack for yourself too. But the point is, is you gotta take control of this. Don't leave it to the responsibility of somebody else and don't think that just because he's paid for it that he's as proficient and professional as you think he should be. Most of them are, but some of them aren't. What about the locking stows? That's a, a big question for a lot of people. Believe it or not, we prefer to double stow with a large rubber band, line, low bulk lines, even on the, the lines that go through a grommet, okay? I don't see any <gasps> okay, well, a lot of people don't like to do this because they're afraid of bag locks. Bag locks are scary, okay? I don't blame you for being afraid of bag locks, but let's think about this, okay? We want to avoid a heart opening. We also want to avoid malfunctions, but basically we want to avoid injury, right? We want to have a good deployment. So bag locks are usually caused by a problem with the pilot chute. Okay, the pilot chute is old, it's worn, it's become tangled with its uh, center line. It is not fully inflated. Maybe you forgot to cock the kill line so that the pilot chute can inflate. Um, those sorts of things normally cause bag locks, okay? 
So it's a pilot shoot issue. Rarely is it a line stow issue. Okay? But let's think about it. Which is worse, a bag lock or an out-of-sequence opening? Bag locks are scary. They require immediate attention. You're still in free fall speed. You can, you can do four-way with a bag lock over your head if you really want to. Um, but the thing is, is it doesn't hurt you. It gets to the end of the lines and you cut away. Sometimes it's actually reluctant to release from the three ring risers because there's not enough tension on it. In many cases, there's not enough, attention, not enough tension because the pilot chute has malfunctioned. It's the drag of the bag. So you may have to actually pull on the risers after you've cut away. But it didn't hurt you unless you try to land it, okay? An out-of-sequence opening is different. If you're so afraid of a bag lock that you stow with a rubber band insufficiently tight through a bag, through a, a grommet, um, it can lead to that, those stows coming out prematurely, so the parachute will come out of the bag before the lines have completely unstowed. So now you're back to that old uh, flat round on the chest kind of deployment. This parachute can't deploy like that without hurting you. So an out-of-sequence opening can do several things. Number one, it's going to open extremely hard, okay? It may um, break your risers, and depending on what kind of uh, RSL or, or system you have, it might break the riser where the RSL is connected and cause the reserve to deploy, even though the other side of your riser is still attaching the parachute to you. So you could have a double malfunction, okay? It can also take, depending on the geometry of the through rings, it can take the, the cutaway cable that goes through that little nylon loop near that grommet, and the force on that cutaway loop can pull that cable, buckle it in half, and pull it through the grommet and wedge it there. So now you've got this parachute that maybe is malfunctioned and you want to cut away, but you can't because the cutaway handle is wedged in there. So now you have an interesting problem to deal with. Okay, but it's worse than that. It can actually incapacitate you. It can knock you out. It can break your neck. It's actually caused people to sever their aortas, where they're dead by the time they land. Okay? So these are not only scary things, but they're deadly things. So you've got these two things. You've got fear of a bag lock and fear of an out-of-sequence opening. I'd much rather take care of not having an out-of-sequence opening. I'm not afraid of a bag lock because it never hurts you unless you try to land it. You just have to act promptly, okay? So I'm not concerned about a bag lock. We've been double stowing our locking stows for probably the last 30,000 test jumps at Performance Designs. Many of those test jumps uh, subterminal. Many of them with pilot shoots that are smaller than we're, we're gonna recommend here. Um, with old pilot shoots, customer pilot shoots that we look, think are pretty bad, but the customer wants to know why his parachute's opening funny, so we do it. Never hurt anybody to avoid an out-of-sequence opening, okay? So that's the way I feel about it. If you have a different thought, that's fine. There's actually a video on our website where we talk about people who double stow every stow, but then they single stow their locking stows. And you can see in this video where as you pull on the bag and it stretches that last double stowed line, it actually stretches out so far that it can actually take the, the locking stow, the next locking stow, and unstow the locking stow because it's pulling so much on the double stow. So it actually unlocks the locking stow before the last stow comes off. And that's not good for your deployment, especially if you've got that rubber band stretched across all that fabric to the grommet. That stow comes undone prematurely, and then the parachute spits out the side of the bag, but you still got a line stow or two left. It gets all weird, okay? Enough on that? <clears throat> Let's move to the pilot chute. Bottom line, it's a parachute. <laughs> Treat it like one. Do not drag it across the ground to the, uh, to the packing area. Don't drag the parachute or uh, the pilot chute or the rest of your kit across the ground to congratulate your teammate winning the world meet or whatever. Sure, you're full of euphoria and stuff, but pick your life-saving device up first, all right? <laughs> you know, the, the, the mesh in the pilot chute is, is very sensitive to being uh, torn up, and it uh, makes a difference. So that's the main thing about the pilot chutes. Is it used? <laughs> Abused? <laughs> okay. Check the center line and the kill line length. 
the center line on the, para on the pilot sheet actually takes the center of the, pi of, the, of the round parachute and pulls it down inside itself a little bit. It changes the shape of the pilot sheet when it's inflated. It quickens the inflation and it provides more force when you do that. But it has to be the right length. There's also that kill line on it. Maybe it's not on your student parachutes, but there's a line that goes through the bridle on a lot of systems on most parachutes that are not student parachutes. And when that line is pulled on, it actually pulls the, the center, the apex of the parachute down to the point where it collapses. And that provides for low drag when you're flying your parachute, if, if some of you students uh, don't realize that. Check that kill line length, because when you pack, you normally step on the bag, and then you hold the bridle and you pull on that center line until it doesn't move any farther. Okay, once you get to that point, look inside the pilot chute and you'll see that kill line that's stretching down from the bag, but you'll also see usually two thin reinforcing tapes. You want to see that those two reinforcing tapes are tight because that is the, the length that that center line should be when the pilot chute's been cocked. If you see those tapes are bowed, then that means your center line is probably too short and the pilot chute's not shaped properly for deployment. It might be almost collapsed and I've actually seen pilot chutes inflate, pull a line stow off and collapse and do nothing. Inflate again, pull a line stow off and then collapse again and it keeps doing that on deployment and it causes weird things to happen. So when some people see this on their pilot should they see, they look inside and they see those two tapes that are, that are bowed while the while the kill line is tight, they try to fix that by taking the outer portion of the bridle and pulling it to make it tighten, and then they think they've solved that problem. But all they've done is they've compressed the outer portion of their bridle. They haven't fixed the problem. They've made it look like it went away. But when the pilot chute gets out into the relative wind, that comes back up. The tapes go slack again. You didn't fix anything. You need your rigger to change that center line to one with a proper length. Okay, so you need to check that. Does that make sense? Look at the condition of the mesh. It gets ratty if you start dragging it across the ground or if it touches Velcro. <clears throat> what about the size of the pilot chute? For normal F111 style fabric, the fabric that is of low porosity, not the zero P stuff, typically about 27 to 30 inches diameter for the fabric. Okay, typically. F111 fabric is a little more forgiving of pilot chute design. It's also more forgiving of the speed that you deploy the pilot chute. It's also a little more forgiving of throwing it in weird places. Okay? It can't have too much force, so we, you don't want to have a big 36 inch pilot chute on, on most parachutes. It's too much force. It can lead to things starting to go out of sequence, actually. It can also be too little force if it's too small below these, these recommended sizes, or if they're too worn out, <clears throat> okay? Other factors, the riser covers. Believe it or not, the riser covers have quite an impact on the way your parachute deploys. There are many different types and designs. In the old days, they were basically a little one inch wide strip of Velcro that went across the side of your, of your uh, reserve container, and the riser was completely exposed coming over the top of your arm, and so was your your toggle and your control lines, and it was a little scary, and they come open, and after a while, the container manufacturers thought maybe they should put a little cover on that. <laughs> and they did, and they put a little Velcro on it, and it's closed, and it, was, it worked pretty good. There were different designs, maybe some worked better than others, but they basically worked well, okay? But then they started making tuck tabs, because riggers hate to replace Velcro. And with tuck tabs, these riser covers and other, other designs may not release at the proper time in the deployment. They may release the left side and the right side at different times, particularly if you're looking over your shoulder, over your right shoulder, watching the pilot chute leave, your body is tipped, the, the, the uh, reserve container, the risers go beside it, and the, reserve, the risers on the left side can't get past the container because of the direction of the pull of that riser, whereas the right side is easy to open and go. So now you got one riser up and extended, the right riser, to full length. The left riser is down and underneath your riser, uh, your reserve container. So your lines are completely messed up. They're unstowing in a strange way. All kinds of things can happen, okay? <clears throat> What's also very interesting is that, and this is something that was discovered basically when when the tuck tab riser covers 
started to become more and more popular and rig manufacturers started getting complaints about the tuck tabs opening up in free fall. And usually the jumper knows it because when the tuck tabs open in free fall, they beat you in the neck and it hurts. So they'd complain and the, the, the manufacturer would try to fix the tuck tab. Now this is actually related to many things, the way the reserve is packed, where the bulk is in the, in the, in the pack job, how proper and neat you are when you tuck the tab in. Some people tuck them in kind of halfway and it starts to bend. It takes a set. There's all kinds of ways you can, you can make these things uh, cause problems. But what's interesting is that if the, if the riser covers do not release at the right time, what happens is that the parachute, basically when the parachute, when the lines run stowing and there's tension on the risers, right? That tension on the risers has to be enough for the risers to open the riser covers before the parachute comes out of the bag, okay? If the parachute does not have enough force to do that, then the parachute will come out of the deployment bag because the locking stoves will come undone and then the parachute gets bigger, right? Because now it, ex it exposes the slider and now it's bigger. Now the parachute has enough drag to open the riser covers, but the parachute is already out of the bag, okay? And that sudden release of risers creates a little slack in the whole system. It's about maybe 12 to 18 inches depending on the design of the riser cover. And that little slack and release tends to cause the slider to rifle down the lines immediately. And it causes really hard openings. And it wasn't until, until those riser covers became popular that hard openings started really hurting people. Now I'm not saying that the riser cover all by itself causes that. I'm not trying to blame container manufacturers because all these factors are interrelated. But do you remember when I was talking about the locking stoves? How important it was to keep those things shut? And how I recommend double stowing a large rubber band on the locking stoves? That is your last chance to get those risers out of the riser covers. You've got the last few lines. Each of those double stowed lines have a little more force, eight to 12 pounds hopefully, to get those riser covers out, or to get those riser covers open. But if it gets to the last couple of line stows and now you've single stowed those things, those stows are gonna come out so easily and your risers are still stowed, okay? So those double stowed locking stows are your last chance to get those riser covers open before the parachute comes out of its, of its bag and it keeps things in sequence. Does that make sense? So it's very dangerous. Now they have uh, magnetic riser covers and a lot of those problems seems to go away because the riser cover stays shut. In fact, if you open one in free fall, it usually shuts again in free fall. Uh, but they open very easily. It takes very little force on the risers, so these things become less critical. Okay, so if you have an older rig with riser covers that have tuck tabs, it's not to worry. Just make sure that your stow force is enough such that the riser covers are pulled open and make sure your your riser covers seem to, to, uh, to stay closed, but actually open when they're supposed to. It feels different on the opening. If, uh, mo usually it's a more an experienced jumper that can tell the difference, but they should come open before the, the parachute comes out of the bag. We've actually seen people come back to us with demo parachutes after they've jumped them, usually smaller people, and they come back and they put the parachute on the ground and ask if we can help them pack and the riser covers are still tucked in, and they've flown the parachute all the way to landing with the riser covers still tucked, okay? And sometimes when run, one riser comes open and the other one doesn't, it actually, for some strange reason, deploys without being hard, but it spins and spins and spins, okay? So that's another cause of a spinning opening, okay? So you need to make sure those are working good, okay? Let's think of another thing. Beginners, what's the one thing you want a beginner to do? You want to make sure that he's aware of what's going on. So we teach them some sort of count, which includes a pull, and then some period of time where they count off a couple of seconds. I'm not an instructor, so don't hold me to the details of this. And then at some point they say, check canopy. You want them to look at it, okay? And of course, they're a little concerned about it too. So they might be struggling to look at it. Sometimes people are taught to look over their head this way, but you can only push it back so far so a lot of people look to the side, okay? And we get into the habit when we throw our pilot chute as more experienced jumpers, 
course, we're supposed to track away and clear our airspace and wave, but there's this nagging thought in your head that there's somebody there. And because we throw the pilot chute there, we tend to look over there just to be sure. So the person tends to be a little bit like this, and sometimes their shoulders get a little bit turned as they look over their right shoulder, or maybe under their right arm. And that sideways tilt of the body, combined possibly with an aggressive pilot chute throw that way, causes the risers to pull to the right, and that causes that one side to hook under the reserve container. Okay? So, Sure, look for the parachute, teach your students to do that, but once you learn what it feels like and the timing of a parachute opening, you don't need to be looking at it when it's doing its thing. In fact, if you're going to have, have a hard opening, do you really want to be all turned around like that? That's not going to be good for your neck or for your spine. So as an expert, when you are familiar with the way your parachute opens, you really don't need to look at it until you really need to. So you throw the pilot chute and you keep your eyes on the horizon and you scan with good body position, you scan for where everybody else is. You know, if there's somebody with a line twist over there coming at you, you want to know that before your parachute's open. You want to know it as soon as possible, and you're not going to know that if you're sitting there doing this. You're not going to help that parachute open any better by looking at it. Now, of course, something feels weird, okay? Or you've got a second, everything's going good, you're sitting in the snivel, everything's going good. You can take a quick look at it. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? but you don't need to look at it as it's deploying, okay? Because you know how it works. And that'll help keep your body symmetrical and your deployments will be better. Now, having said that, don't forget that when the parachute opens and it feels like it's flying normally, don't forget to look at it. There might be damage on it. There might be a broken line or a split seam. And a lot of people don't notice that, or maybe an entangled control line, and they don't notice that until it's a little too late to do something about it. So once you're open and you've determined you've got clear sky that you're flying into, make sure you do take a look at it, of course. <clears throat> okay, and again, like I said before, the locking stows and their effect on whether those riser covers get open at the proper time, keep that in mind. Okay. And also keep in mind that every one of these factors we've talked about are interrelated. Every one of them, right from that design of the parachute, fabric type, the inherent characteristics of the parachute, the way it's supposed to open when everything is done correctly. All those things are interrelated with your deployment speed, slider position, line stows, pilot chute size and condition. All of it's interrelated. So when somebody has a hard opening, sometimes somebody goes, well, that's the problem right there. Look what you did here. You really can't say. You can't pin it to one thing because they're all interrelated. We get away with murder on a lot of this stuff. Uh, that wasn't a pun, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, we get away with crazy stuff. You know, the thing about letting the lines not go around the nose of the parachute when you're packing, because that supposedly can create a line over. Pretty much every pack job I ever open from a customer has lines over the nose doesn't seem to cause a problem. If it did, every single otter load would have a bunch of cutaways on it, okay? But these things are interrelated and they stack up. So maybe you're going a little bit too fast. Maybe your line stows aren't quite as tight as they should be. You're probably going to be okay most of the time, but then you add one other little thing, a tip of the body, a riser staying under, and that's the one thing that adds up with those other things that causes the explosive opening, all right? So there's some laxity in the sport. We want to know what we can get away with. You know, come on, guys. <laughs> Let's think about that, OK? Some people I've seen do some packing uh, methods, and they look really scary. And they see I'm agitated by it. And I go, oh, what do you do that for? And they say, I've got 247 pack jobs just like this, and every one of them worked perfectly. Well, every one of them worked maybe not because of that brilliant idea. Maybe it worked in spite of that crazy idea. So if it worked many times, it doesn't necessarily make it right, okay? New idea, treat a hard opening as if it were a malfunction. If you have generally good openings and then you get whacked, something went wrong. Do something about it. Slow down, look at these factors, see what went wrong. Talk, if you had a packer packing it, talk to him and don't Blame him for the hard opening, because what he has done is one of the factors. What you've done is a factor. I see a lot of explosive uh, discussions in the packing area where these guys, they, they don't get thanked. They make good money, but they don't get thanked for anything until something goes wrong, and then they're on the defensive. 
So when I see that, I might say, did you have a hard opening? And they say, yeah, sure did. Well, who packed that thing? You did? Okay. Well, who unpacked it? Oh, you did. You were the unpacker. You have just as much in this game as this packer. And the packer goes, gee, I never thought about that. So you, if you are the unpacker, take responsibility for your portion and take responsibility for what your packer is doing. But treat it as a, as, a, as a malfunction so that you can find the cause and solve it. Okay? Bottom line, do everything reasonable to avoid hard openings. Now, one way is just not to jump, but that's not reasonable in my book. But there's a lot of things that you can do, and if you have a getaway mentality, I can get away with it. it it's it's going to catch up to you someday. Okay, I've lost a few friends on hard openings. It's not, it's not pretty, so do everything you can. Come on. Um, we've got a lot of videos online. This seminar that I just took... Uh, about 50 minutes to do. I get a little rambly when up in front of people, but online with the magic of editing, it's about an 18 minute video. So everything that I've talked about here, they've carefully weeded out the mumbling and everything and they've got it to 18 minutes. Yes, I know, I mumble. <laughs> so they're, on, they're online. Um, this video about avoiding hard openings, the one about, it's called the locking stow myth where you actually see a locking stow come undone before the double stowed stow before it comes undone. You can see that. Uh, information on how to pack, uh, how to flake and fold and get the parachute in the bag are, is online too. When we put our first video out, um, one of our uh, tour reps did it. We got a lot of feedback and they said, well, that was like a 135. I jump a 190. Sure, it's easy for you. So next video is how to pack a large canopy. And you can see that there's a method and a way of, to control it. It's all there. Um, like, a, oh, 16 minutes. Um, we also have uh, one of our factory team members packing the competition velocity, showing that basically everything is the same, it's just a little more bulk. Also, she has the removable deployment system, which is used in some competition canopies. She'll show how that's done, that's Jessica. Um, there are also educational vid uh, videos about downsizing and, and the, the myths about that, um, how to fly your canopy in general. There's also some, some things that are designed purely to entertain. There's some humorous uh, poking at some of the people at our staff. Um, we've done a few videos. There was a, a TV show on, I think, HBO. It was called um, The Office. It was pretty popular in the, in the States, and it was kind of a goofy, dry humor. We do kind of a spoof on The Office, and we poke fun at the, um, the research and development people and the marketing people. It's really quite humorous. Um, go to our website and see that stuff, and I think you might find it informative, and if not, a little bit funny. And that's it. Thank you very much. I hope this has helped you.